What is up down and sideways, you absolutely gorgeous individuals? Welcome to another Reppy Up Week on my Eric and Mark. Here with you guys for a final preview of 2024. Unless there's some show matches to close out the year or this new 2025 format actually starts this year. But it's the final round of the World Championship T1BLG. And honestly, at the start of the tournament, if you said this was going to be the finals, it's it's right up there probably in terms of one of the best matchups you could have hoped for. I, I It's got to be in the top three that people would yeah. say right out of the very gate, I'll take it. I'll take it. That's my finals. I don't need everything else. Give me that showdown between the best of the LPL and the titan that is T1, the defending world champions once again in the finals and again one more time the reason you'd be frothing at that matchup is because pre-worlds that version of t1 had no business making it to a final so you would have had to have seen a pretty gigantic level up and well that's exactly what we got throughout this world's run so we start with their paths to the finals how did these two squads actually get here and you know, sometimes you look at Weibo last year, you're kind of saying, wow, that feels like an easy road for them to have gotten here. But both of these squads, kind of a similar power level of teams they had to get through to get to this point. You start with T1, started the tournament with a loss to top esports. Everyone's panicking. And then they get the softball pain gaming matchup. And that was all the momentum that they needed before already beating this BLG lineup, then 2 0 wing G2 to get out of the Swiss stage, 3 0 wing in the rematch against Top Esports, and then 3 1 in that marquee Gen G semifinals. Oh, baby. Yes, that is the path of the T1 level up that we have seen through this world championship. And it's a real easy path to, to chart out because, again, you start with that loss to Top Esports. And it was one of these ones where, yes, there were moments and, yes, there were times where it was close, but it really was, you know, the way the Top Esports were able to team fight. It was Tien's counter engages. It was Jackie Love on that static shift, Jin build doing all that damage. Then you get the pain gaming game. You get that rebound, of course, for T1. We get through to that next spot. And you get, again, that match against G2, where, again, you saw that type of power. You saw the level up in the BLG series before that we were talking about the power level. And you really saw it in the quarterfinals in the rematch against Top Esports, the dominance, the absolute control and pace A T1 was able to close out that series. That is the T1 that are the defending world champions, that are the T1 that have been to three consecutive world finals now. That's the path that they laid out. That's, and then you look at that as a whole, that's only two losses total that they had throughout that run, you know, that top esports one and then the one to Gen G in semis. The BLG side of things, initially you say, this looks a little bit maybe easier. Number one, okay, they have a Western team to kick things off against Mad Lions Koi. Then they drop games to both LNG and T1. Everyone's panicking. BLG is one series away from being eliminated before they even get to top eight. But both of those losses, I think people were saying LNG and T1 just kind of played out of their minds. It wasn't like BLG was terrible in those matchups. And then we got the slow level up to take down PSG, an incredibly competitive uh, best of three against G2. And... That's two non-major regions that they beat to qualify for top eight. And at that point, I think we were all still a little bit sus on BLG. But as soon as you get to that bracket stage and they draw Hanwha life in those quarters, I still feel like that was the perfect matchup for them because they basically had a semifinals level opponent immediately, which means they had to level up right away. You had to be, uh, you know, wary of this BLG team, despite the record that they started out with uh, out of the gates in that first, you know, three or so matches of this world uh, championship. Looking at how they played, you're still saying this isn't unfamiliar. This is the BLG that I recognize. It was just, again, you laid it out, LNG T1, more about how their opponent rised up on the day and what they were able to do. That still causes a little bit of concern as you look at BLG and you go, okay, well, we need to start seeing a little bit more come online, a little bit more of that fierce dragon that was fighting all the way through the LPL. 
you got to see that in these knockout rounds in these later stages is where it really became the blg show you had of course been doing what he does in the top side but it ain't about that it's about checking in on the mid lane checking in on mr knight in what he's been able to do in the legacy that he is carving out at this world championship and down at the bottom lane looking at your boy elk and how he has contributed and again this has been a big year of continuing that glow up from him that started last year and um yeah, I mean, this is probably the best individual performance out of night so far that we've seen at an international event at the very least. But uh, those two paths the teams took, the knockout rounds are honestly almost flipped in what you were seeing. They both 3-0, an LPL team, and a competitive, what should have probably gone five-game set against what were the two top teams from the LCK. So both had a challenging bracket run to get here, but now sitting pretty for that marquee matchup in these world finals. You dropped the L word, legacy, heading into this world finals. And we want to look at who has the biggest or the most on the line in terms of their legacy in these finals. And yeah, spoilers, it's not Faker. Faker can go winless for the next entire year, and his legacy is pretty safe. But uh, outside of Faker, I think you can talk about all four other T1 members, and this being an important finals, because winning two out of three finals or one out of three is a very big difference. And if T1 comes away with this, I think you're putting these other four T1 members as like best in their respective roles when you look at a stacked history of T1. A secret, it's a, it's a sandcastle building competition across the League of Legends community. Faker is out there and he's not fighting fair. He's building with cement. That is what his castle has stood the test of time. It is still there despite the high, the low tide, all those type of things. The rest of T1, still sandcastle, still capable of being eroded by the tide until this series because if they win this one i think as well they start to cement their castles with that sturdy building block material that we know is stood the test of time like baker i'm looking at a guy like kyria down in the bottom lane someone that a lot of people selves included have very early identified the type of talent and unique person that he can be and what legend he can carve for himself in the in the pantheon of all the amazing players we have seen the title added to this one that would be a pretty darn big one for me looking at the skills and the play and the and the play set that he brings to the table as a player and i think you know we forget how early these guys still are in their career all four like guma's the oldest of them at 22 years old so regardless of what happens after this year for them if they end up on different teams whatever there's still many pages to put uh in the book for all of these guys but three straight world finals and if you win two out of those three i mean you're already in like all-time conversation especially for your respective roles and again at the top of mount rushmore when it comes to t1 specifically in stacked roles so a lot to play for for those four guys and then when you look on the blg side i think the obvious first one to talk about is knight in the mid lane his first finals we've talked about this guy as one of the best mid laners on the planet for what four plus years now and he has a chance to be that first non-korean mid laner to hoist the summoners cup since what are we talking toys in season two and there's a lot of eyes on night now after the series that t1 had against gen g and the individual performance of trophy throughout this world championship there is a lot of people a lot of attention and unfortunately a lot of haters a lot of doubters coming through again people that challenge that there will ever be Someone that can rise up to that type of level of faker can be a challenger in that type of realm of that elite that we talk about. This is your shot. This is your moment, Knight. You got to make sure that you take it. You don't want to miss one of these ones as, you, as they start piling up type of situation. You got to start early. Get that advantage. Get it going. This is a big one for Knight, and he's had a lot of performances. I think we've had still... You know, not necessarily as many uh, as someone like Chovy, but he still has been around these events. He's had some disappointing finishes where people go, we needed to see more. He had to be a bigger player. This is one of these moments where you can rise up against this upgrade, this T1 that is in form to be, again, a world championship contender. Can you take down the best of the best? 
and you know this a world championship is obviously a massive check mark but the last check mark for knight to hit we've seen him win mvps and be at an mvp level on what three different organizations he's won multiple lpl titles in a row he's won msi that world championship is the last big tick he needs to do and if he does it against faker well all of a sudden you get two extra check marks then it's an extra it's an extra point situation no question for for someone like knight and, and what you're looking at i think the big one again he has dominated the lpl since he has been there he has emerged as the top option no question in that mid lane and the type of skill set that he can provide to a team now it has to get done on the international stage because yes all we want to talk about msi lpl championships all these type of things they might matter to you and i they might matter to people in the lec and the lck but you go to the lpl you listen to how they talk about it they don't care shauhu all of his incredible things doesn't matter my man loses to faker on the international stage he's a bum which we all know that's not true number one <laughs> number two but that goes to show just the type of pressure and importance that is on succeeding on the international stage for the LPL, succeeding on the international stage against the LCK, and succeeding against Faker, the number one roadblock for LPL success. Yeah, you can lose in the first round of playoffs in every split. If you win Worlds, nobody cares about what happens in uh, those LPL splits. And then the other guy on BLG, I think, that has a big legacy game you can talk about is mr bin on that top side his return to the world finals for the first time since his rookie year basically on sooning and for how long we've been talking about him as one of the most premier top laners again not just in the lpl but worldwide he's 21 mark 21 years old already got two at least world finals under his belt but if he wins this He's won MSI before again. He's got all the check marks, but that world championship and to get one at 21, let's see it. I'm I'm scared for the rest of the league community if Bin does get to win this one because the path that he will be set on and how he will blaze everybody around him is going to be something different if he is able to capture this one and start building his own legacy in this type of way of international championships he has rebounded i think since that we've talked about blg not necessarily being at their best you know not looking unfamiliar but not exactly being the dominant blg that we have seen run through the lpl getting in these knockout stages performing more like that bin has been a big part of that keep jacks out of this man's hands i don't want to test it i know you got a little bit of a counter on the side of zeus you can bust out that gragas we've seen and we've praised it many I don't want to test. I do not want to run the, the chances and the numbers against Bin's Jacks. And, you know, he talked about it in an interview. Holding the weight of the LPL, they've never beaten T1. The LPL as a whole, pick any Chinese team. They can't eliminate him from Worlds. If they do it against Faker and T1 in the finals, then, again, both Knight and Bin getting, poof, the stocks are going way high for both these solo laners for BLG. Now all that's left, we got to do the actual main preview. We're going lane by lane, Mark. Who's got the edge across the board? And we were just talking about him. So let's start with Bin versus Zeus in that top side. This is a tumultuous rivalry. I feel like we've swayed back and forth. We've had MSIs where Bin has completely gapped Zeus and he's been called a choker. But the last year or so, it's been Zeus who's been the one getting the better edge. This is such an interesting matchup because you have that back and forth, because you have the examples of Bin just crushing, dominating all the pressure, turning towards Zeus. And then we've had Zeus rise up, stand the test, be ready for that against Bin uh, in the most recent example, of course. This is going to be a messy one up in that top side. You better expect to see some early and often action up in that top lane. Yeah, and obviously now in this meta, it's not just a 1v1, it's who can be better at lane swapping. I think we've seen both of these teams do some incredible dives and some flabbergastingly bad dives when it comes to lane swaps. But, you, you know, you mentioned, we have to mention the Jax for Bin. Eight out of his 15 games, by the way, at Worlds have been on that Jax. So whether it's Zeus pulling it away, it being banned, or as we've alluded to, that Gragas counter pick for him but the other surprise uh champion for both these guys is only a single cassante game between the two of them at world so far love it 
Love it. Love to hear that. The, the blessed non-Cassante guys up in the top side. I, I got a feeling we might see a Cassante game here or two in this series. It's an easy uh, fallback blind pick, right? Always a fallback. But one of the things you did mention is that Gragas pick that we talked about. I think that's one of those ones where if you are BLG, you're not necessarily scared of it. I would like to see the, str uh, the strategy of just banning it. If you are going with an idea of saying, all right, we are planning on roll swap. We are planning on that lane swap, making sure that this goes down and we want to make it as safe as possible, not letting over that tool into the hands of Zeus and how T1 have shown it to be something that can withstand and negate a lot of the advantages you might try to gain with that lane swap. I'd watch out for that if I'm BLG. Next matchup I'm looking at, this is the most important one. This is the most integral, has the biggest potential to sway the whole series. We're jumping right to bot lane, and we're looking at the supports. Because Kyria and On. On has had some great Rakan games. He's played a lot of Rel. Kyria hasn't played Rel at all at this tournament. He's been too busy picking up Pike and Bard throughout. But what we saw against TES and then followed up by Gen.G., Kyria is at that best support in the world level right now. And if On plays similar to the level he has the last couple of series, this is looking like a support gap. I, yeah, that's going to be the concern for a lot of people. It's, it's one of these ones where I don't want to introduce it to say that there is regular inconsistency in a player like On, but there is a reason why it's a check on one of these games on whether it's On or off in the bottom lane alongside elk is usually the question that you're asking for that duo because you look at what happened with t1 you look at how they pressured and were able to absolutely prey upon lehens in that gen g series if you're a support and you're not on your a plus game you're a liability to your team because you better believe that kiri and t1 are bringing that a plus game to the room and yeah, as soon as you combine it with the bot lane buddies, that's when, uh, I mean, there's less 2v2s, it feels like, these days, straight up in uh, what the meta is getting because there's so many different lane swap variations, whether it's 80 carry top in the top lane, supports roaming mid, it's rare to get that straight up 2v2, but when you, obviously, Elk and Guma are both walking highlight reel machines. If you look at any of these top five, top 10 plays so far at Worlds, Elk and Guma are featured uh, quite often in them. But when you look at the picks we've seen out of the bot laner so far, Elk is 5-0 and zero on Kai'Sa. Guma hasn't played Kai'Sa yet. We know he can play Kai'Sa, but that's a pick to look at. And then, of course, Elk has piloted the Ziggs. T1 has steered as far away from Ziggs as possible at this World Championship, but might have to play against it in Elk. Well, seeing how T1 was able to push against the Ziggs in the Gen G series, uh, I don't know if I'd want to try that one against T1 in this type of situation. Yeah. The Kai'Sa, that is the one I would identify for Elk and really prioritize because I think it plays, it's not necessarily about what Elk is doing on Kai'Sa. It's more so about what BLG can provide for that Kai'Sa, providing the opportunities for her to alt in, pop someone, get that team fight started in that type of way, set up. Her for success, that's the biggest one for me when you look at players like Bin, Knight, Hell, Jun Wei. I don't care which one it's going to be in the jungle. They will be setting up that Kai'Sa to feast if you are letting that one go through. That one's what which what I would be worried about. I'm really worried about Guma's champion pool. We we are very stable and, and, and set with it and, and confident with what he can play. The X factor is Kyria and what he's going to play down in that bot lane duo. I don't think we're getting... Anything as wacky as when we had Yasuo and Camille and, you know, all, all these other type of things. But you better expect that you might see Pike, that you might see Bard come through. Again, these little ones that are maybe kind of one-offs here or there not hovering outside the meta. The way Kyria plays them, they're meta. And you better be prepared for these champions coming through. Caitlyn Lux, always a terrifying duo that we know T1 will bust out too to take over some games. And Kyria, all of a sudden, becomes the AP carry when he's piloting uh, that Lux pick. But yeah, Kyria gets the big edge over on Guma and Elk. I'm calling basically a coin flip. Both of them can take over games. Uh, mid lane, Knight, Faker, it seems insane to say heading into a World Finals. But current form, individually, edge has got to be for Knight, right? It has to be for night, but I want to say, how many times have we stepped up into a matchup with another high-profile player and gone, okay, 
current form. Everything's got to be pointing to him having that edge. I'm coming away from the series going, what a play by Faker. What a big moment by that. So you have to keep that in mind to understand that the margin of this edge is so slight in the favor of top esports. But that is the type of player that Knight has been through this event that you can give him that type of edge over someone even as accomplished and even as reliable as Faker has been for T1. I think that you're going to be looking again, the, ch the champion pool, what it's going to be. Uh, yeah, the Yone, that's a big one, of course, for both of these guys. Faker showing a little bit more comfort, a little bit more proficiency on the Yone throughout this event compared to going through the LCK regular season. This is going to be one hell of a showdown. And again, I want to bring up the legacy part of this one, because if Knight is able to get this, it vaults him into a whole nother stratosphere of these contenders that have been to dethrone Faker. Ari the most played for both of them. But yeah, uh, Knight has played 12 champions to Faker's six, twice as many unique champions as the Unkillable Demon King. Lastly, owner versus most likely Jun, maybe we see a way game, but BLG hasn't been on the back foot in a game to have to sub in. But international owner, I don't care which one of them it is. This guy is absolutely terrifying. Skarner, Vi, and Kindred are the big three picks we're getting in this series for Jungle. And this is where I want to see some of that experience come through for T1. This is where you got to go. I'm in my comfort zone. I'm in a world finals again. This is where I belong. On the other side, it's BLG going up against the Titan, trying to pull off an upset of whatever degree type of thing. You need to come in with going, I'm home. This hey, that's where I left. Uh, that's where I left my water bottle last time I was here. All these type of things, and get in your zone. That's what I want to see from owner to dominate the jungle at this stage with the pressure that will be there. That's the factor that I'm looking for. So when you look at laning head to head, T1's getting the edge, and most of them, except the slight one, maybe tonight, even Zayu spin. I think you're giving the slight edge to them, which screams to T1 winning on paper. But we know. World Championships, it's a five-man unit, and things can go oh so differently. I, we just want a banger of a series, and I think we're absolutely going to shatter some viewership records, no question. Even if it's 3-0, five games, it doesn't matter. It's going to slap. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, Beauty. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity-flip.